there was a uh, um, a conference in Ely, Minnesota, that honored uh, the 50th anniversary of Paul Seipel and Admiral Byrd. Admiral Byrd, probably most of you know who he was. He uh, wrote the book called Alone when he wintered over in, Ala in, uh, in Antarctica. And uh, he was a very famous Arctic explorer. He uh, was convinced by the Boy Scouts of America in 1928 to allow an Eagle Scout to go down there and winter over with him. And so they had a contest to see who would go, and that turned out to be Paul Seifel. Fifty years after that, 1978, uh, Sandy Bridges, who some of you might have heard of, basically he and uh, a few other gentlemen, uh, Bob O'Hara, uh, spent a lot of time in the Northern Arctic, uh, Henry Bradledge, Anyway, a whole bunch of gentlemen and myself restarted the Boy Scouts winter camping in Ely, Minnesota. And so Sandy knew Moores, and he knew me, and he knew Lars, and a whole bunch of people that were interested in survival in the winter. And he brought us all together in Ely, and we had a great time. And that was the first time I met Moores. And uh, it seems like we've been couldn't shut up the rest of the time we've known each other. <laughs> so I'll try to uh, uh, tell you a little bit about how I got into survival. Basically what the survival school does is, as you probably know, teaches all the air crew people survival. Well, when did it start? Well, it started in March of 43. And as you know, most of you, that, that we were in the war during that time. And there was a process of uh, loaning airplanes to the Russians. We were, we were buddies at that time. And uh, we uh, had something called Lend-Lease, where they would build the airplanes in the, in the lower 48 states and fly them across Canada. And of course, everybody was scared of the Arctic and scared of Canada because it's wilderness up here, you know? I mean, my gosh, you guys live out in the middle of nowhere. And so the people were scared. And it, well, sometimes there's a reason for that because it's cold and nasty, and you know. <laughs> but uh, so as they as they started to realize that they have people that need to be maintaining the airplanes, <coughs> uh, they went to Lincoln, Nebraska. I say they, and I don't know who they are, but there was some representatives of the Army Air Corps that went to Lincoln, Nebraska, and recruited some folks. Uh, they recruited six gentlemen, which you'll see their picture here in a few minutes. And I got to speak to one of them, his name was Clyde Clymer, and he gave me a lot of these pictures here and uh, told me the stories of how this basically came to be. They started out going through training at Echo Lake, which is this camp right here, which is just up the mountain west of Denver. And they stayed there for about six months. Then they moved to Chip Lake, which you know in fact, most of you have been there. And some of you know more about that place than I do. And I'm very curious to ask you questions about it, so I'm willing to listen to anybody talk about Chip Lake and what you know about what the survival school was doing there. The only thing that I know is that they moved a group of people, which you'll swell. I'll just get to them. Uh, this is... Uh, this is up at Echo Lake, where I just told you about, next to Denver. Uh, these are the first six uh, Air Force, Army Air Corps, excuse me, survival instructors. The uh, guy on the right, his name is Lopez. The guy, the next guy on his, to his, going right to left is, uh, is Clyde Clymer. And then there's Al Gephardt, and the rest of them I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. But, uh, so that was the first six that were ever recruited. Some of you might recognize these gentlemen, other than reading their names. Wilhelmar Stephenson, of course, on the left, a very famous uh, Arctic explorer. Uh, Ennis Taylor was uh, Admiral Byrd's uh, head dog handler uh, down in Antarctica. And Valmore Brown, very famous outdoorsman for many years in the early 1900s. The first commander was Ennis Taylor. And this, I believe, this picture is either at Echo Lake or Chip Lake. I don't know which. 
and uh, just like you folks have up here, a lot of snow. <laughs> uh, they told me that uh, this was a, a canvas hut, and uh, they had they were living in it, and then they had to crawl up the top of it and dig out the wood or dig out the door so they could get out. And lots and lots of snow, even up in uh, Echo Lake. Uh, this again is the summer of Echo Lake. This was a uh, 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 ski lodge that they uh, that they stayed in and uh, they used for their uh, their big they didn't stay in it they used it for a big uh, classroom and uh, the uh, they used the buses to transport students back and forth to the training area from Denver up to the training area and out to the woods and of course Stephenson's actually teaching the students that became the cadre of instructors at this point in time out in the woods. They, we, they used to walk a lot. Um, I know that uh, most of you like to walk, but uh, most GIs don't like to walk because they're either supposed to be flying airplanes or they're supposed to be in tanks or, or some other kind of vehicle. And uh, at any rate, at survival school, they, they walk 50 miles at least in a week. And uh, that's not a whole lot, but uh, when you're not eating any food, except for what you can scrounge or, or catch or steal or whatever, then that's quite a bit. Uh, so they had to have a lot of other things to do as well. This group right here, this is the first picture and, and one of the only pictures I have of Chip Lake. This is actually the buildings that were there and uh, that's the staff of all the instructors, the cooks, the commanders and everybody that was actually working at your Chip Lake. And uh, I have never seen this place, but hopefully I'll see it today or two, or maybe tomorrow. I guess we're supposed to go there tomorrow. Is that right? Is that where we're going to go dig rat roots? No, no, no. We're going to the lake itself. We're not going to the site. Oh, okay. <coughs> I'll, this... take, I'll take you there eventually. Oh, yeah. Oh, I've been promised I'm going there. Huh? Anyway, this is a reunion of, okay, let me go back to this picture here. The guy, the little short guy in the direct center. Let me see if I can. See the little guy right there on the bottom? Yeah. Sitting cross-legged. That is Clyde Climber. And by the way, all of these pictures that I'm just showing you, they're black and white. Some of you remember during World War II, there was a lot of rationing going on. There was no such thing as film to be used for recreational purposes. There was no way that you could buy it. So all of these pictures were were taken in a four by four Hasselblad type uh, uh, format, and the the gentleman Clyde Climber used X-ray film because he could scrounge it from the doctor, and he was able to save some of these images. And that's the only reason that we have these images here is because I got to go see him down in Weezer, Idaho. But if you look, um, you see that the GIs are standing in the back. If you go the second GI from the right, the guy in the green shirt below him, and the guy below him, which got the red, uh, got the white flat, white-haired flat top, that's Clyde Clymer in 1989. Uh, he came to the survival school to have a visit. And these are some of the old guys that, uh, anyway, that uh, were. Here in your in your country, when they uh, the old guys in civilian clothes anyway, <laughs> when they were working up here, this is uh, part of a scrapbook, and these didn't turn out too good. But just just real quick, you see the top right there? You have the uh, lean-to with the fire in front. That's what most of the students lived in. Not a whole lot's changed. The lean-to with the fire in front is still pretty good, huh? <laughs> uh, and they really had it nice. They could go fishing on the lake, of course. That's not Chip Lake, as you well know. That's Echo Lake. But uh, on the bottom right there, they were, they were allowed to carry in things like milk and eggs and whatever they could carry on their back. These were instructors now to carry in to be able to, to live with. So, okay, come on now. Is this machine going to quit working? There we go. Yep, everything was carried in on pack boards. And they worked pretty hard. Okay, there's there's your lean to. That's actually Echo Lake, but they did the same thing at Chip Lake. This is 
is just the larger pictures of what we just saw there. These are uh, nothing but uh, plywood and two by fours and canvas. And that's what they wintered over in. Now we're going to make a major jump here from the 40s to 1965. Some of you know about um, Vietnam War and have heard about that. Uh, this bunch right here was the first class that was taught at Clark Air Base in the Philippines of the Jungle Survival School. Uh, the commander's in the very back there. Um, but uh, what we did was we, we had a, a three and a half day course. They were required to go through the uh, 21 day course in Spokane first and then they were shipped over to the Philippines and they spent three and a half days. They would, they would have a half a day of academics, a half a day of laboratory where they'd walk around in the garden and look at We had a big huge garden that had every plant you can imagine, every animal you can imagine that was all in Southeast Asia. Bears, snakes, uh, alligators, crocodiles, everything. And we had that so they could see those. And we had a whole bunch of stuff, booby traps that the VC were using. And we'd show them how to not get caught by those things. And then they would go to the jungle for two days. Their last uh, half of a day was an evasion uh, uh, exercise where those the, uh, the uh, native peoples, that, the aboriginals that lived there, they were called Negritos. And they would uh, go looking for them. And they were highly <laughs> motivated to find them because they got the, uh, if they found them once, they got a, a pound of rice. If they got them again, they got another pound of rice. And if they had an emergency, they got five pounds of rice. So um, they were highly motivated to go looking for them. And anybody that could not get caught by them did pretty well. There was a fellow named Roger Locker that was shot down in, uh, in northern Vietnam, 40 miles west of Hanoi. And he made the statement, he was down, he was the longest on the ground, 29 days, and then he was rescued. But uh, he made the statement that really says it all about the Jungle Survival School, and that was, he says, you know, he said, when I landed on the ground there, it looked like, it smelled like, and it felt like, and I looked around, and it was no different than Clark Air Base. And he says, I wasn't scared. He said, I'd already been there, and I'd already evaded from the best guys looking around. He says, well, I wasn't scared of He just knew what to do. Anyway, that's the Jungle Survival School. Does anybody recognize any of those people? Yeah. Who? Otter Hayes. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is not Iwo Jima. <laughs> the, funny, the guy with the funny hat on, who is that? You. No, that's not me. <laughs> no. Looks like Bob Newhart. Senator? John Glenn. John Glenn. Yeah, that's Senator John Glenn and Wally Shiraz on right hand side. Neil White is the next one to the left of or and to Neil the, Armstrong on the left. And and Neil Armstrong, that's right. Yeah, so all the astronauts that ever went to space were required to go through desert training, through sea survival training, through jungle survival training, and this is in Panama. Now that black gentleman there is Mr. Trujillo. And he was a Panamanian instructor who was able to teach all of these gentlemen jungle survival. So uh, we've had a lot of famous students that have gone through the survival school that, uh, you know, they lived. What can I say? <laughs> this is some of the students that, I'm, it's kind of jumping around here, sorry about that. But this is some of the students that were uh, tromping around the, the woods at Camp Carson. The Camp Carson is, uh, the, the, what basically happened was, in, in, in 43, they went from Echo Lake to Chip Lake. At the end of World War II, like Clyde Clymer says, he says, you know, they all gave us our ruptured ducks, and we worked so long over here by Chip Lake, he says, we decided we were going to go to Lake Louise, so we grabbed a Jeep, filled it full of gas, drove down to Lake Louise, and saw it. It was pretty, and so we came back, and then we, what happened was they just closed everything down, and they loaded up their, their trucks, and took everything that was of any value, that they thought was of value, and they drove down, not to Camp Carson. Well, they drove, first of all, to uh, Boise, Idaho, and dropped off a whole bunch of stuff there. And then they dropped the rest of everything, including their vehicles, off at Camp Carson in 1946. 
Okay. Then when they restarted the school in 1947, they actually restarted the first school for the Arctic in Nome, Alaska in August of 47. Of course, in, 40, in, in September of 47 is when the Air Force came into existence. So the survival school was actually older than the Air Force. So whatever. Not that that makes rats, but that's just history. <laughs> um, when they restarted to restart the school in 49, it was at Camp Carson, which is in Colorado Springs. And if anybody's ever gone to the Air Force Academy or seen anything about that, they actually used a part of that place called Sailor Park, which is up in the mountains. And uh, they used to have the students walk from there clear down to uh, Camp Carson, which is uh, basically a, about a 70 mile walk. Anyway, that's some of the students. Some of you have probably heard of parasailing. Uh, we've taught thousands of students to parasail. And the only reason, basically, that we ever got involved with parachuting of any kind of training was because in 19... Well, we moved from Camp Carson in 49, left... The, we started in 49, we moved to Stead Air Base in Reno, Nevada in, the, in the 1953. And that, this is Stead Air Base right here. Uh, it's a desert area. They used, of course, the Sierra Nevadas for, for training. Again, they would walk about 60 miles out of the Sierra Nevadas down to Stead uh, as their last couple of days. But this gentleman right here, his name is Tony Martino, and uh, he was one of the guys that did a lot of, of uh, ingenious training things. One, one story, he, he was at Hamilton Air Base in, in Southern California, and they, have, they were having a lot of trouble with people not knowing how to, to use parachutes to get out of airplanes and get to the ground. They could. So what they decided was that a lot of the problems were in the landings and in what to do while you're in the parachute. So the survival school basically teaches from the time when they, you say, oh shoot, I got to get out of this flaming machine because it's going to kill me, to the time that you come back and are eating the ham dinner with your wife at home. We teach everything from all of those situations all over the world, no matter whatever the environment is. Well. Getting to the ground was a biggie. <laughs> uh, so they decided that they had to teach people how to parachute without actually getting them in the airplane. <laughs> so parasailing was one of the things they tried to do. And what they tried to do first was do it over the ground. That's pretty hard landings. But what they did was they hooked up this guy to a Jeep and he ran <laughs> along fast enough until he finally got in the air, of course, into the wind. And you got up about 300 feet. Well, that worked fine if all worked well, but generally speaking, what would happen is the parachute would start oscillating like this, back and forth, and he guy'd be swinging and swinging, and bang, he hit the ground. Well, <laughs> Tony, Tony broke an arm one day, and and so they decided, well, let's try this over water, and so they did it over water, and that was a lot easier to land on. So that's when they started the water schools at many different places throughout the country. Uh, they had about a dozen of them. Well, the, the, funny, the, the funniest thing that ever happened to Tony, I think, was they had something, they had a, a four telephone poles that they stuck in there about 50 feet high, and they had something they wanted to figure out was called a swing land trainer, where you could get in the, in, the, in the harness and you could swing back and forth and then crash into the ground and hopefully land right without breaking legs. They called that swing land trainer and they wanted to teach people how to do parachute landing falls. Anybody here airborne? Anybody in the military was airborne? Nobody? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess we're all dirty old rotten legs. Well, that's okay. <laughs> Any? Pardon? Well, that's good. So what they did was they put these four posts, these four telephone poles in the air, and they had guy wires and everything, and they were going to have this swing land trainer where you landed and swing back and forth and land. Well, Tony, again, is going to be the guinea pig. <laughs> he was a gutsy guy, I tell you what. He's gone now, but he was a gutsy guy. He was the kind of guy that said, I'm never going to learn to swim because I want these people to trust their gear like I do. So he had 500 water jumps, but he never knew how to swim. <laughs> he says, I trust my equipment. Well, anyway, he was, he's all in. So Tony is going to land, do this swing land trainer thing, and up drives the base commander in his staff car. And he says, what are you doing, Tony? He told him my first name because he's, anyway. 
He said, well, we're testing out this new, this new training rig. And the base commander says, the hell you are. And he says, are you, how many people have ever been in there? He says, well, I'm the first one. And then the base commander is one of those leaders that really gets out and leads. And he says, I'm going to be the first one. It's my base. Tony says, uh, I don't think so. He says, that's get out of there. I'm doing this. So he got these big telephone poles in there and the base commander gets up in there and they start swinging this thing back and forth and the, what happens is the telephone poles do this and they darn near killed the base commander <laughs> and you can imagine that he was not happy so they, they got him up and dusted him off he, he, anybody heard of General LeMay it wasn't General LeMay but he was kind of like General LeMay you know he's buy a cigar and half and spit it in your face but anyway this base commander was ticked off and so he marches over to his staff car, picks up his phone that's in there and says, says, tells those guys in civil engineers to bring all their telephone pole stuff out there and fix this thing. <laughs> so the survival school has been known for doing things for without forgive, you know, forgiveness is easier than permission, <laughs> you know. The way they started actually teaching parachuting and demonstrating parachuting was there were some sport parachute jumpers like you. And these guys were survival guys. Well, they had C-47s. And there was, there was two of them assigned there. And these guys said, you know, the students need to see some of us jumping out of this airplane so they can know that these parachutes work. They'd never been to jump school. They'd never been and, and done any jump training, but they, were, they had to do it. So they got their gear together and just jumped out of the airplane for the <coughs> students. They did that for about three weeks. And somebody comes over there and says, are you guys airborne? No. What are you doing jumping out of a military airplane? We're trying to show our students. Holy cow. We're going to send you to jump school. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> it was just kind of crazy, but that's how most of our, our training got going. Um, this is one of those places up by Camp Carson. Anybody know what that Quonset looking thing is called? Quonset? No, it's Quonset. called a James Way. James House is what they used to call it. It's basically a canvas covered bunch of wood sticks and a floor that is like a Quonset. They had a wood stove in there. Anyway, that's where they, they lived there. And that's the first six guys. We're, we're, we're repeating ourselves here. So, uh, anyway, we moved, we moved from State Air Base 1966. And in 1966, we moved to Fairchild. They uh, have been at, they basically have been at Fairchild uh, teaching global survival since. Uh, we've had, uh, well, let's see, during Vietnam, when I first started carrying crews back in 68, uh, we would have 250 people in a class. We'd have 17 elements, and you might end up with a dozen to 15 people in your element. And you have one instructor, and he'd be responsible for teaching a week's worth of training out in the field and 14 days on the base. But, uh, you know, you would do everything. You'd walk into camp, uh, maybe five miles. You'd, you'd go ahead and uh, do shelters, fire, food, water, shel uh, trapping and snaring and all that kind of stuff the first day. Uh, then you'd do some more of that. Uh, the next day, different shelters, signaling, those kind of things. And then for the last four days, you were on the trail. Two days you were just walking and learning how to navigate, and two days you were actually evading from a, uh, some type of an operational force that was chasing you down. Um, and then, of course, you know, I mean, Marvin, you probably heard about this, but they all got to go spend some time in the prison camp and learned about how to be a prisoner. And uh, they were taught about the code of conduct and that kind of thing. But uh, we've been doing that ever since, and I don't know of any reason why they should quit. Uh, it's, uh, we, uh, we had, I retired in 88, uh, went back to Minnesota and I saw Moors again back there. And then, uh, we, uh, well, let's see, we, we started, uh, I started working as a contractor for the U.S. Customs Service in 95, 94. And did that until 2000. In 2000, I went back to as a contractor for the uh, survival school because they were low on people. And uh, worked in field training again for five years. And then they said, you're getting too old. So they put me in uh, academics for six years. And then, uh, anyway, 
So here I am. But uh, I, I, I kind of like more as I'm kind of an old dog with one trick. I don't know much, but but that. So uh, anyway, that's the that's pretty much the story of the survival school. Uh, we have uh, all kind of other things, but uh, any questions on the survival school? Uh, first of all, I'd like to ask you, who, who's been to Chip Lake and knows anything about what was going on over there? Well, just just, just whatever Morris told me, and then, uh, what was it, Morris, probably 10 or so years ago that we entered that private property and we toured it, and uh, we seen the stumps about three or four feet high cut, and with Morris's knowledge, he figured that, yeah, that was about the second Second World War era time that these stumps were cut way, way in the background, and uh, that's about all what I know. Whatever Morris told me, because he he told me the history of how he found out about it when he was in Sweden. Is it, has anybody uh, have any relatives that, that used to work there or knew anybody that worked there or anything? Mm -hmm. Well, check. We have this. Um, history book this. here in the area called Where the River Lobstick Flows. Okay. And there is zero information in there whatsoever about it. And But there is lots of inf information about the prisoner war camp just down the road. Well, that's very interesting. And um, Morris and me, we um, again entered private property and we found the, uh, found the dump from the prisoner war camp where all the old plates are. Oh, wow. Well, it seems rather odd that the U.S. Air Force, or excuse me, the Army Air Corps, United States Army Air Corps, would have a school in Canada. But I think what they were doing was, well, I don't think so. I, what happened was during land lease, they had they had these different uh, uh, airports, or it was the same time that they were building the Alcan Highway, and of course that was a that was originally a, a, a very snaky and up and downhill type road because it was a tactical road. And a tactical road meaning that if an airplane was trying to strafe it, they couldn't hit but a little bit of it on a strafing run. They couldn't drop bombs on it because it, it was curvy and ups and down hills. And that's, of course, as you would well know, that changed quite a bit. Um, but uh, so they also had these different spots. And I believe that uh, they, they ran air airplanes up I think it was White Horse. They had a uh, uh, an airport, and then they had one at uh, Delta. And there one there at, was a Stewart River too. One at Stewart River. Spirit yeah, Washington. it was the whole thing was called the Northwest Staging Route, wasn't it? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. 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 And they that was where they would take their land lease airplanes, and they had a specific route that they had to fly because they had these specific bases that they had to land that to get refueled because there was no refueling in those days and in between those spots there was caches about every 25 miles a cache being a building with a stove and full of gear and clothing and food and everything and first aid and, and rifles and shotguns and everything you needed to survive for the rest of the winter until you could get rescued and they had like every 25 miles along there they had one so those places in Canada then they had one in uh, they had one in uh, Delta Junction. They had one in Isleson, which was called Camp 28 Mile. They had one in uh, uh, Galena, and they had one in Nome. Well, uh, well, they had one at Fort Greeley as well. So uh, Nome, Greeley, uh, I of uh, Isleson, Fairbanks there, and Galena were places where the Russians came in and they would fly their airplanes in with their pilots and a lot of the pilots were women because all the guys were going off to war and so has anybody heard of the 99's? Abby, come here. Nobody's ever heard of the 99's? The 99's is a group of ladies who were young college girls during World War II and they were the first pilots to fly ferry work where they would ferry the airplanes up through, through through Canada and into Alaska and give them to the Russians and a lot of the Russian women were the ones that came and flew back too and picked them up. So the gals had a big time history of of supporting the military actually flying those airplanes. Some of those airplanes like I think Morris or somebody was telling me that 
that a lot of them crashed because when they when they were when you as some of you well know when you when you uh, break in an engine it has to be broken in slowly well they didn't have any time to do anything slow they were hauling those things up over the as far as as quick as they could get them over to the eastern front well a lot of those airplanes the engines just quit they seized up quit and of course if they die they crash and the girls would die well they had that's one of the reasons why they had a lot of concern the first thing that happened was they were concerned about the ground crews that were living up there well the ground crews were okay they were taught by these guys that went up there first to Chip Lake. Then the guys that were flying up there, the lady says, hey, we need some training too. Can you give us some training about how, <laughs> what happens if we crash this airplane? How are we gonna survive? That was the first time the air crew ever got any training whatsoever. It was because they said, hey, you're training these guys on the ground, well train us too. We're out there hanging it out. So we need to get this training. So they started training them as well. and. And it just kept on getting bigger and bigger. It had a bit. It had a big lull, like I said, between 47, or between the, the end of World War II and, and 47 and 49, where there wasn't a whole lot going on as far as survival training goes. But uh, other than that, I, I think you've pretty much got the history of, of what survival training was, at least in the Air Corps. Uh, now, what about the Army and the Navy and the Air Force? Well, or is the Army, Navy, and the Marines? Most of you probably realize that the Marines and the Army uh, pretty much do survival training all the time. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're surviving all the time. So, however, lately they have uh, uh, come under the Department of Defense and they're doing their training as well. Uh, the Navy, uh, actually, the, there was this gentleman named uh, uh, Chuck Klusman who was the first fellow that was shot down in Southeast Asia in 1965. He was shot down in the, uh, June of 65. He was actually over Laos, and uh, he was uh, shot down, captured, and was held in the Khan Kai prison there uh, by the Pathet Lao until August when he escaped with a uh, young fellow named Boon Mi. And he and Boon Mi were able to evade uh, an escape out of, of, uh, of that area and were picked up uh, at, uh, at a place called uh, Lima Site Number 28, which was run by the Air America people. And uh, when Chuck Klusman came back to the States, he said, hey, we need some survival training over there. <laughs> and that's when, in 66, was when they started the jungle survival training in Panama, or excuse me, in the, in the Philippines, because of demand. Well, the Navy and the Air Force didn't really get along too good, you know, that pride thing, you know, the, the Army, you know, the, the, there's a lot of inter-service inter, inter competition. So the Navy went to Subic Bay, and the uh, Air Force went to Clark. And they did a little bit of collaboration, but not much. So. And that was closed uh, at the end of Vietnam in 73, pretty much by accident, but anyway. Uh, but yeah, anybody that knows anything about uh, this area here, I'd sure be interested in talking to you about, uh, about this area as far as Chip Lake goes. Um, so, any questions? <laughs> Where on Chip Lake? Where on Chip Lake? I don't know. Moore's going to show me. <laughs> I, I understand from what from what Clyde Clymer said. He he was a fiddler, and uh, from what he told me, he said uh, that they had a they had built a, uh, some kind of a gathering building, a dance hall is what he called it. I imagine it was a multi-purpose building where they showed movies and had dances and whatever. And uh, he said that uh, he always took his fiddle with him, and he took his fiddle over here, and he says he played a lot of money. Uh, he played a lot of fiddle and, and made a little money off, off duty, you know, for dances. So I guess the local folks were trying to make our you guys feel pretty comfortable, and that was good. So uh, that's all I know. Uh, I know that they, uh, that they had uh, a pretty tough winter here the first couple of winters. In fact, Clyde, they didn't have any barracks. They had tents. 
And of course they were building them. And Clyde spent his first winter in kind of a hut. It was kind of a, a lean-to looking thing, about four or five feet high, kind of like one of those small trapper cabin things. And he took the, the ration boxes that were wax covered and he used those to make the outside of there. He took a, 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 a tent, a, oh, okay, that's fine. I should, I should turn that off anyway. He took a, uh, well, yeah, it's gonna get dark, so. But he took a, uh, uh, a one gallon can and a whole bunch of, of, little, of uh, beer cans that were steel in those days. He made the stack out of beer cans and he made the, the stove out of the one gallon can. And that's how he kept that little hooch warm.